Okay, let's talk about the peptide bond. It's uh, one of the more important bonds that you will encounter in biochemistry. It is a bond that joins two amino acids together. So it's a bond that has a very specific name. Two amino acids together. So that is our peptide bond. So let's begin by drawing any two amino acids and join them together via this peptide bond. So we'll have amino acid one. Alpha amino group, alpha hydrogen, any type of R group, and a COO minus or COOH, it really doesn't matter. I'll just put COOH, that proton is ionizable. And then we react it with a second amino acid. So I'll put the second amino acid in green color. <laughs> Alpha hydrogen, this will be the R group of the second amino acid could be the same or a different R group. And then we'll have the R alpha carboxylic acid. In this case, it can be protonated or deprotonated. So this will be amino acid two, and this is amino acid one. Okay, so now we join these two amino acids together and create a peptide bond. So we're starting to make proteins. This is not a big protein, it's actually two amino acids. So we actually call it a dipeptide for a very, very short protein. Um, but usually short, small amino acids joined together by a peptide bond are known as peptides. Um, larger, larger peptide bonds, more and more amino acids, we tend to call it a protein. So a protein is basically um, a lot of amino acids joined together. Uh, a peptide is a small protein, so this would be a dipeptide. So here's the reaction that occurs. I'll put this in a different color. Okay. So what happens is that um, the carboxylic acid group, the alpha carboxylic acid, reacts with the alpha amino group. So this OH will react with one of the H's and then water comes out. So this is actually a um, dehydration reaction where water is removed. And now you have a peptide bond. All right, so we'll have an NH3 plus CHR. Okay, so now we have a C double bond O. This is all from amino acid one and then an NH, CH here is amino acid two, and then the carboxylic acid on amino acid two. So what we have now is the crux of this video, and that is this bond right here. This is the peptide bond, C double bond O and H. C double bond O and H is the peptide bond. Okay, so this holds amino acid one with amino acid two together. Likewise, I could do this again for amino acid three and I'll have another peptide bond. In this case, I'd have a tripeptide. I can do it for another amino acid, add a fourth one, and it will be a tetrapeptide, like that on and on and on and on I go. And then essentially we're going to build um, amino acids one by one and we'll have a larger protein complex. So it's important to realize that this is just a one dimensional flat piece of paper depiction of the peptide bond. You know, amino acids have a three dimensional structure and that's something we'll talk about later on in the course. Uh, so just looking at it one dimensionally, this is the peptide bond. All right. Amino acid one is in orange, amino acid two is in 
green. Now, there's some special characteristics of the peptide bond, uh, which makes it an important bond for us to study. Okay, one of the things that we want to talk about in terms of the characteristics of the peptide bond. Okay, so let's just focus in now on the C double bond O and H, which we have stated before is our peptide bond joining amino acid 1 with amino acid 2. Okay. One of the characteristics of this peptide bond is, one, it defines a polarity. And that polarity is N to C, N terminus to C terminus. You can imagine that if I continue to do this, sort of like adding chains to a chain link fence, um, or and adding bricks to a brick wall, um, what happens is that I'm going to develop a polarity. I'm going to develop an N terminus as this grows bigger, and I'm going to have a C terminus at the end. And so uh, we usually define a polarity of N to C. So as I continue to add amino acids, okay, I'm going to have an N terminal end defined by the alpha amino group of the first amino acid, and I will have a C terminal end that's defined by the alpha carboxylic acid of the last amino acid, whether that's amino acid 2 or amino acid 50 or amino acid 100 or amino acid 1000. So the peptide bond sort of establishes this N terminus to C terminus polarity. The second characteristic of the peptide bond is that by nature of this bond, there is um, some rigidness and planarity. Okay, so okay, what do I mean by rigidness and planarity? Well. By planarity, it means that if you were to buy an organic model set or go to the one that you've had in organic chemistry and actually make a peptide bond, you'll actually see that it's actually flat on a piece of paper. So this C double bond ONH actually appears flat. Okay, You can uh, overlay it on a piece of paper. Nothing comes out and nothing comes um, back. Let me just focus this a little bit. So uh, that's what we mean when we talk about uh, planarity. Okay, looks like the focus is back on much better. So the peptide bond is actually planar. Right? Now, rigidness refers to the fact that um, there's actually very little rotation about this bond. So bonds can rotate. Okay, so you probably may have heard of cis-trans isomerization or rotation um, across, a uh, across a bond. Double bonds don't rotate much. Uh, single bonds do. Um, this rotation uh, is actually impeded. Uh, so that makes uh, the peptide bond, uh, the joins two amino acids together, kind of rigid. It makes sense if you think about it because you want that bond that joins two amino acids together that will eventually constitute your protein. You want that bond to be rigid. You don't want it to be easily labile. You don't want that bond to be easily breakable. Okay? So rigidness and planarity. Rigidness means we really can't rotate across this CN bond that well. And then planarity means that this C double bond ONH is pretty flat. Nothing comes out uh, towards you and nothing comes out beneath you, uh, three-dimensionally speaking. So you can overlay this on a piece of paper. Now coming back to rigidness, I want to also um, give also talk about an extension of point two, and that would be point three. Okay, so let's move this tape, uh, piece of paper here. Point three about the peptide bond has to actually do with the fact it's rigid, and that is partial double bond characteristic. Okay, so that alludes to rigidness that talked uh, that was mentioned in point number two. So partial double bond characteristics of the peptide bond. 
And so point one, it, the peptide bond defines a polarity, N terminus to C terminus. Point two, the peptide bond is rigid and planar. And point three, the peptide bond has about 40% or so double bond character. That's according to your textbook, 40% or so double bond character. And what do we know about double bonds? Okay, they tend not to be so uh, permeable to rotation across that bond. Okay, they tend to be pretty rigid. So if we delve on this a little bit more, we'll find out why um, there is a rigidness to the peptide bond and why there is a partial double bond characteristic, where that double bond character comes from. Uh, it comes from the fact that here is our peptide bond again. Okay, here is amino acid one. Here is amino acid two. There's actually a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen. And there's actually two lone pairs of electrons on the oxygen. Right, so there is a resonance that forms where this pair of electrons can go here and that pair of electrons can go down there. So as a result of that resonance, you'll get this structure. There's a negative formal charge on the oxygen. We have a C double bond N now. And then here's amino acid 2. Okay, so remember your resonance structures. Okay, here's one form of the structure. And it's um, sort of is mixing or is in an equilibrium with the second form of the structure. That's a resonance form. Now, <clears throat> This nitrogen has a positive formal charge. Remember, we have to conserve the charges. This peptide bond in this variation has zero net charge. This peptide bond in this variation has zero net charge. This minus um, cancels out with the plus. We can't have any charges anywhere. They have to all be accounted for. So this is a zero net charge. That's a zero net charge. This is a resonance uh, across the peptide bond, a resonance formation or a resonance structure. Structures, we have two resonance structures here. Okay. So this can go back and forth. We have the peptide bond going back and forth between a single bond between the C and the N and a double bond between the C and the N. Now, which form of the resonance structure is more stable? That's a question that I'd like to pose to you. All right, so this is actually the more stable resonance structure. This is the more stable resonance structure simply because of the fact that we don't have any formal charges. See, this second form of the structure is not as stable. We want to minimize formal charges. We want to minimize uh, any minus signs on an atom. Here, there's a minus sign on the oxygen atom. And there's a plus sign or a plus formal charge on the nitrogen atom. So we want to minimize those. This is the best structure and it's the more stable structure. So we can imagine the peptide bond to be more, uh, more stable and more prominent in this configuration as opposed to this configuration. That doesn't mean this configuration does not exist. It may as well exist, but we can say it's a minor form because of the formal charges, which are a little bit messy on the atom. So given that this is the minor form, you can actually see that there is some double bond characteristics, a double bond characteristic that the peptide bond could actually exist in. So the textbook and you know other chemists have theorized that uh, this double bond character is, constitutes about 40% or so of the, of the peptide bond. So by looking at the resonance, we can actually see that the peptide bond does have some double bond characteristics. And by virtue of it having a 40% or so of double bond character, the peptide bond has within it some rigidity. So it's so difficult or it's kind of hard to rotate across the CN bond. We wouldn't expect it to be so easy to rotate as opposed to any other single bond, which would expect more uh, rotation or more degrees of freedom. All right.
less degrees of freedom, less degree of rotation here simply by the resonance allowing for a minor form having some double bond character between the carbon atom and the nitrogen atom. All right. So those are three main characteristics of the peptide bond um, that um, you should be aware of and you should familiarize yourself with. Okay, so once again, the peptide bond is C double bond NH and it joins two amino acids together. All right, let's move on now to a couple of other points with regards to the peptide bond and its characteristics. All right. The fourth characteristic of the peptide bond that I would like to talk about is that because of the double bond character of a peptide bond, we have to ask ourselves the question, uh, what do double bonds imply? Well, the answer is that double bonds imply a cis or trans character across that double bond. And so the peptide bond usually is in a trans configuration. Is except for proline. Okay, if you remember proline, proline is um, a cyclic amino acid and it actually uh, gives rise to cis uh, peptide bonds. Okay, so because of the 40% double bond character of the peptide bond, usually the peptide bonds that join amino acids together are in the trans configuration. 40% double bond character or so. So what does that mean when we say um, trans configuration? It basically means, um, if I were to draw this, here is our peptide bond again. I'm going to draw this like this, okay, to characterize that this CN bond has some double bond character, okay? So we'll just put a little dot here to show that there is a little bit of double bond character between the C and the N and the C and the O. So that double bond character is shared across all three atoms. And we can have, here is our alpha carbon. We can have it when we fill out the atoms again. Here is our alpha carbon for the second amino acid. This is amino acid one. This is amino acid two. Okay. Here is our alpha hydrogen. Here is our alpha hydrogen. The R groups are going to be trans to one another. They're going to be on opposite side, opposite sides of this pseudo double bond. Okay, that's about 40% characteristics. So here's R group one of amino acid one. Here's R group two of amino acid two. Okay, so that's what we mean when uh, we talk about the peptide bond being trans. It's alluding to the fact that this has some double bond characteristics. The R groups are going to be stationed uh, opposite one another in the trans configuration. Now this actually goes back to sterics. Okay, if you have a big bulky R group, an R one maybe. Uh, the aromatic group of phenylalanine, and you have a, another side chain in amino acid two, maybe the guanidium side chain of arginine. Um, for them to be cis, they they would clash. They would have a steric clash. So to minimize steric clashing, remember these side chains are big and bulky. Some of them are at least. They want to avoid one another, okay? Because they take up space. So to best minimize. Uh, steric clashing to best avoiding any type of uh, atoms that are going to hit one another. Trans is the way that they could be far farthest apart with one another or to one another. So typically the peptide bond is in a trans configuration except except for proline. Okay, proline is one of those uh, finicky amino acids where the peptide bond will be in a cis configuration. Okay, so except for the amino acid proline, the peptide bond would configure these amino acids. There are chains to be trans to one another. Okay, so this would be how it would look like if you have a peptide bond for proline.
Okay, so here's the alpha carbon of proline. Here is that cyclic structure of proline. Okay, here is our peptide bond. Okay, here is our partial double bond characteristic. Here's the alpha carbon of amino acid 2. And then here is the R group of amino acid 2. Okay, here's the hydrogen. So the amino acid proline would have a cis double bond. Or a cis peptide bond that would be in a cis configuration. Whereas all the other amino acids would be in the trans configuration. So when I say cis, here is the R chain or R group of amino acid 2, and here is, I guess you can call it an R group of amino of proline, though proline, because of its cyclic nature, does not have a side chain R group. But you can see that the atoms usually will face each other in the same side of this pseudo double bond, the 40% double bond characteristic of the peptide bond. Okay, so peptide bonds are going to be in the trans configuration except for proline. Proline has a cis, um, cis peptide bond. That is, proline, would, its cyclic atoms. Now, proline does not have an R group, so please uh, be cognizant of that. Its atoms would be or tend to be on the same face as the second amino acid to which it has a peptide bond to. Right? So cis double bonds for proline. So those are four characteristics of the peptide bond. Let's just review very quickly. Okay, what are they, if you can remember? All right, number one, the peptide bond defines an N to C polarity. Okay, what's number two? The peptide bond is rigid and planar. Point number three, the peptide bond has a resonance, thereby imparting it with a double bond characteristic. And point number four, is that because of that 40% or so double bond characteristic, the peptide bond usually is in a trans configuration except for proline in which it is in a cis characteristic. The final point, the fifth point that I want to mention uh, with the characteristics of the peptide bond um, requires you to understand this concept of dihedral angles. The peptide bond actually defines two dihedral angles. So the peptide bond, let me just zoom this in a little bit here. And those angles are called phi and psi. Phi is going to have this symbol, it's from Greek, and then Psi, kind of like that pitchfork, is going to have this um, Greek symbol. So what are those angles? All right, so let me attempt to draw this. First of all, a dihedral angle is an angle defined by three atoms. And the peptide bond defines those three angles. Let me go ahead and tell you what the angles that phi represent. Phi represents the angle between the alpha amino group of one amino acid with the alpha carbon. Okay, so this is the angle phi. You can rotate across this bond, okay? Psi would represent the angle by this alpha carbon and the C double bond O of the next amino acid. So rotation across this bond here is defined by the angle psi. All right, so the alpha carbon, its bond with the NH, the rotation across this bond is defined by the angle phi 
the alpha carbon, the same alpha carbon, with its bond with the C double bond O carbonyl group, rotation across this is defined by the angle psi. So let me try to draw this, though your textbook has a better explanation in terms of visually, but I'm going to attempt to draw this. So I'm going to attempt to draw this realizing that your textbook has a much better depiction. But I'm going to start off with my alpha carbon. All right. Here's my alpha carbon of amino acid 1. So here is its R group. The alpha carbon has with it attached its alpha hydrogen. Okay. And now to that alpha carbon, we have a peptide bond. So I'm going to kind of draw, kind of draw it like this here. Here is my peptide bond. <laughs> and here would be the alpha carbon for amino acid 2. <laughs> okay. So remember, the peptide bond is planar. Okay, so here's amino acid 1, here's amino acid 2. I can go ahead and extend from here okay, to this alpha carbon. There is the carbonyl group attached. To this alpha carbon, there is the NH group attached. And here is the peptide bond for this amino acid. So here's amino acid 1, and here's amino acid 2. <coughs> so here's my planar peptide bond. Draw it like that. That's one plane. Okay. Here's another plane. All right now, let's put in our phi psi angles. All right. So, what are the angles that we mentioned? Define phi and psi. All right. The angle that defines phi. Let's begin with phi first. Is the angle between the alpha carbon and the NH. So this defines phi. So rotation across this bond. I can rotate it clockwise or counterclockwise is phi. And then what defines my psi angle? What defines my psi angle? The alpha carbon with the C double bond O. So that defines psi. So you can rotate this clockwise or counterclockwise. All right. <laughs> so imagine what are you doing when you rotate you pick one alpha carbon, I could pick this one, or I can pick an alpha carbon below. I can just extend this as long all the way up the length of this piece of paper, but I'm just looking at two amino acids, amino acid two and amino acid one. What happens when I just take my finger, okay, if I take my finger and here and take that nitrogen here, hold them with my little tweezers or my little fingers and then rotate okay holding everything else constant if i hold this and hold this and i rotate across this bond what am i doing i'm changing the angle between this plane and that plane all right similarly let's say if i take little tweezers or my fingers and hold the alpha carbon and the C double bond O above, and then rotate, everything else being still, rotate about this bond, if I rotate it back and forth, counterclockwise or clockwise. What, ha what, ha what is happening here is that I'm rotating this plane relative to this plane. All right. So that's what phi and psi actually define. They define a set of angles between plane one of this peptide bond between C alpha and the C carbonyl group, C double bond O. And it also defines an angle between this plane and this plane, between this C alpha carbon 
and this NH group. Okay. So these planes can be at different angles relative to each other. All right? So they actually control the angles based upon the size and characteristics of your R group. Okay? Of your R group. So there would be specific dihedral angles for phi and psi dependent on whether these R groups are compatible with one another and as long as they don't clash with one another. If you can imagine that this R group be a glycine where the side chain is hydrogen, you would expect a lot more degrees of freedom and motional freedom for those dihedral angles, also known as torsional angles. Okay, so dihedral angles and torsional angles uh, for purposes of discussion now are going to be synonymous, are going to mean the same thing. So what I want you to realize is that phi and psi define angles between these two planes defined by this peptide bond, a peptide bond that joins this C-alpha carbon with this amino acid, okay, and this C-alpha carbon with the next amino acid below it. All right. <laughs> so as a conclusion, let's just summarize our dihedral angles. We'll talk about the dihedral angle and our heading. The dihedral angle between this alpha carbon of an amino acid and the NH group, okay, this comes from a peptide bond, that angle is called phi. It's the angle name. And what does it control? Okay. Imagine that this is a joystick. Okay. I hold the C-alpha carbon. I hold the NH. I rotate across this bond. Okay. So I rotate across this bond. Okay. What is happening? these planes start to move relative to one another. If I hold this nitrogen still and start rotating across the C alpha, this plane is going to move while this plane is going to stay still. Okay. If I hold the C alpha still and rotate the nitrogen with my fingers or my tweezers and rotate across this bond, okay, this plane is going to rotate relative to this plane. So what does it control? Okay. So here we have C double bond O and H. Here is our alpha carbon. Here's your C double bond O again. Here's our peptide bond. And this is what phi controls. Okay. Rotating across this bond. Now, this may be hard to visualize, so you may want to get your molecular building set or your molecular models, but not only are you rotating one peptide bond plane relative to another peptide bond plane, but to be more specific, okay, these C double bond O's, these carbonyl groups, are going to rotate relative to one another. Okay, so if you hold this NH still and rotate this C alpha, the alpha carbon, this C double bond O is actually going to rotate while this one stays the same. Okay. If you hold the C alpha carbon still and rotate across this bond by rotating the nitrogen, okay, this C double bond O will stay the same while this C double bond O will rotate relative to this one. So that is really what the dihedral angle phi represents. So they are acceptable dihedral angles, and they are non-acceptable dihedral angles. Well, what determines if an angle is acceptable or not acceptable? What determines if a dihedral angle is accessible or non-accessible? Well, it has to do with the size of these R groups, this R group and that R group. Okay, 
the size of the R groups really determines all of that. All right, our final dihedral angle that we want to talk about is the dihedral angle between C, the alpha carbon, and the C double bond O, also known as the carbonyl group. That is known as the dihedral angle psi. And this is what it controls in terms of the joystick. Here is our NH. Here is our C double bond O. Here is our alpha carbon. And here is our NH. Psi controls this bond. Okay, so as we said before, it does control the two planes of the peptide bond, but more specifically, it actually controls the angle between this NH of one amino acid with this NH of the adjacent or second amino acid. So if I were to hold the C alpha carbon still, and take the C double bond O and rotate it, what happens? This NH stays the same. This NH rotates relative to that one. Likewise, if I were to hold the C double bond O still with my little tweezers or my small fingers and rotate the C alpha carbon um, across this psi bond, if I rotate this holding this still, Okay. This NH stays the same while this NH rotates relative to that. Okay. So what determines the accessibility of a psi angle, the angle that's defined between the C double bond O and this alpha carbon? Well, just as the same with phi, what determines the accessibility has to do with the size of the R groups. Okay. So this is very important because you're going to have accessible dihedral angles and you'll have non-accessible dihedral angles. You'll automatically imagine glycine to have a lot of conformational freedom simply by virtue of its very small side chain of hydrogen. Okay. You can imagine maybe something like proline to be more conformationally restricted. First of all, it has cis peptide bonds and you will not expect a lot of motion across phi and psi for proline. Likewise, maybe you won't find much uh, conformational freedom for phenylalanine or tyrosine because of the big bulky side chains. Okay? So all of these phi psi accessibilities uh, are, are determined by their degrees of freedom. They're determined by the bulk and size of the R chain. But all of that can be um, seen in terms of protein structure and visualized and determined by what's called a Ramachandran plot. And that is something we will talk about um, in our lecture series. Ramachandran plot. Okay, these are huge because, um, or at least it was huge back in the day because they actually tell us what phi psi angles are permissible for uh, proteins as um, we build amino acids to build these complicated protein three-dimensional structures. All right, so five main points of the peptide bond. Number one, peptide bond characteristics. Number one, it defines an N-terminus to C-terminus polarity. What's number two? Rigid and planar. Number three, double bond characteristic by resonance or double bond character. Fourth characteristics of the peptide bond is that they're usually trans. Remember, proline is cis. And then the fifth characteristic is that it defines dihedral angles phi and psi.
So know these characteristics of the peptide bond, be able to draw the peptide bond. Okay, pretty easy to draw the peptide bond that joins two amino acids together. Amino acid one, amino acid two. And make sure you know some of these characteristics that make the peptide bond a very special type of bond uh, because um, it is the bond that holds proteins together. All right, so we'll talk more about this in lecture. This is for those that may have been a little bit confused about what's happening in lecture. Uh, you can uh, use your PowerPoint notes and you can also consult this uh, video. All right, thank you.